morning. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our virtual presentation. This event is part of the Frank Islam Ateneum Symposia Series. I'm Dr. Fiona Glade from Montgomery College's Germantown campus. I'm the Dean of Communication Studies, English Language for Academic Purposes, and Linguistics. As the curator for the Ateneum Series, and on behalf of Germantown Vice President and Provost Margaret Latimer, I'm honored to welcome you all today as we warmly welcome Congressman Jamie Raskin back to Montgomery College. This distinguished speaker series is made possible through a most generous gift from our donor, who is also joining us today, philanthropist and civic leader, Mr. Frank Islam, and his wife, Ms. Debbie Driesman. A powerful philosophy created by Mr. Islam drives the Ateneum Symposium. If you conceive it, you believe it, you can achieve it. The Ateneum series covers a host of topics, including international affairs, social sciences, the humanities, economics, the arts. This year, our lineup explores the theme of advocacy, activism, and public engagement. And in today's presentation, the Congressman will talk about partnerships, polarization, and constitutional patriotism. This promises to be a really exciting contribution to our theme. You can find more information about all our speakers this year by visiting the Montgomery College Ateneum website and by joining our mailing list. Our presentation today is being recorded and will be available on the website soon. Before we go on, I'd like to take a brief moment to recognize the work of a few great MC folks who have contributed to making this event happen. Ms. Kaylin Wynn, who provides admin support, our Ateneum Fellows from Germantown, Professor Katima Lee and Professor Amanda Miller. And thanks also to Mr. Stan Jones and Mr. Arkar Kyowin, our MCTV technology experts. And now I'm most delighted to introduce to you our esteemed Senior Vice President and Provost, Dr. Sanjay Rai. Thank you, uh, Dean Blades. Good morning, everyone. I am delighted to welcome all of you to the inaugural Frank Islam Athenaeum Symposia at Montgomery College for the fall 2021 semester. I am honored, I am simply honored to introduce Mr. Frank Islam, an entrepreneur, a humanist, a philanthropist, a global citizen, and a great friend to Montgomery College. Today, for the first Frank Islam Athenaeum Symposia for the fall 2021 semester. This symposia is possible because of Mr. Islam's generosity and support. It has brought speakers like Lily Ledbetter, Arun Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi's grandson, and many other distinguished civic and business leaders. Our students have greatly benefited from their remarks and interactions with them. For community college students, this is a great learning opportunity. And we thank Mr. Islam for providing this opportunity to our students. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are not merely words for Montgomery College. They are an integral part of our DNA. Our students represent all races, ethnicities, religions, including 170 countries. Today's speaker, Congressman Raskin, is a true champion of equity, inclusion, and freedom for all. Mr. Islam truly represents the American dream coming from humble beginnings from India as a student working hard, playing by the rules, and creating a business and infor information technology firm called the QSS Group, which he sold for $300 million. And now leads the FI Investment Group. He has used this hard-earned money to provide opportunities for his students from Aligarh Muslim University in India to Montgomery College, Montgomery College in USA, the United States Peace Institute, 
at several institutions around the world. He truly embodies the phrase, to whom much is given, much is expected. He serves on several boards, including the Brookings Institution and the Woodrow Wilson Center National Cabinet, and President Obama appointed him to the Board of Trustees for the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. He has established a reputation as a writer, authoring two books and blogging for the Huffington Post and the Medium. Among, among his many awards is the Martin Luther King Jr. Legacy Award for International Service and the Montgomery County Business Hall of Fame. Throughout his lifelong contributions as an, as an entrepreneur and civic leader, Frank Islam has worked in his own words to create opportunities that are sustainable and uplifting for humanity guided by the virtues of hard work, focus, quality, innovation, and kindness. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Frank Islam. Well, thank you, Dr. Rai. <laughs> I don't think I deserve that kind of a wonderful and thoughtful introduction. And thank you, Fiona, for your leadership, all you're doing to make a difference. And Sanjay is a dear friend. And your, your introduction is fantastic. And thank you very much. I should have you everywhere from my introduction from now on, because you do a great job. It is pleasure to be here virtually with you, Congressman Raskin, and I'm sure he will be here pretty soon. Some, uh, he's not here yet, Fiona? No, he's clicking in now. We're, um, we're making sure he has the technology he needs. Okay. It is pleasure to be here virtually with you, Congressman Raskin, on all of the Athenium participants. I know that everyone would rather have congregated in person, but perhaps the fact that we are gathered here virtually is appropriate today because in a sense, we here to talk about virtue. Does the virtue of our American values and how we must strive together to form the more perfect union envisioned by our nation's founders. There is no one more qualified to address this topic than Congressman Jamie Raskin as a part of this series on advocacy, activism, and public engagement. The title of this talk is Partnership, Polarization, and Constitutional Patriotism. I'll introduce Congressman Jamie Raskin now and you understand why we are so fortunate and privileged to have him with us to speak about our country's past, present, and the future, and how our engagement can make our nation a better, a stronger, fairer, and inclusive place. Congressman Raskin is currently in his third term representing Maryland's eighth congressional district in the US House of Representatives. He has had a more distinguished career as a lawyer, professor, and as a public servant, one that includes a lifelong work service along with an abiding interest in higher education. Let me tell you a little bit more about him beginning with his educational connection, moving to his Maryland legislative roots, and concluding with his role in the United States Congress. A Washington DC native, the Congressman earned his BA and his JD from Harvard, where he was also an editor of Harvard Law Review. His career accomplishments include working as a professor of constitutional law at American University's Washington College of Law for more than 25 years. During that time, Congressman Raskin co-founded and directed the LLM Program on Law and Government, and also co-founded the Marshall Brennan Constitutional Literacy Project. The project is a nationally recognized program promoting democratic engagement, constitutional literacy, and legal advocacy by placing talented law students in high school 
to teach year-long courses in constitutional law and oral advocacy. Price Merdaskin began his legislative career as a Maryland state senator representing the Tacoma Park, Silver Spring area from 2006 to 2016. During his three terms before he served as a Senate Majority Whip and is credited with significant contribution to his studies for landmark legislative accomplishment, including the repeal, repeal of the death penalty. In the United States Congress, Congressman Raskin is a member of the House Judiciary Committee, the Committee on Oversight and Reform, and the Committee on House Administration. He's probably best known though for his role as the lead impeachment manager for the Senate trial during the second impeachment of President Trump. Thank you, Congressman Raskin for doing such a fabulous, wonderful and thoughtful job. You deserve a lot out of recognition and you should be rewarded for that talent that you have. That's a brief review, review of Congressman Raskin's resume. It is truly indeed impressive. In closing, I can tell you that more impressive is who Congressman Raskin is as a human being. I can say that clearly and mistakably because I know Jimmy Raskin personally. He's a friend of ours, an ally of all who are interested in promoting religious freedom and protecting our democracy. Congressman Raskin presented me with the third annual Interfaith Leadership Award at the Interfaith Conference of Metropolitan Congress of Washington, DC in 2016. I'm pleased to return the favor to introduce all of you to Congressman Jamie Raskin, a friend, a special person, and a true patriot. His voice, his values, and his vision are critical and, and compelling addition to the Athenium Symposia stage. It is a testament to the philosophy that I created, which drives the Athenium Symposia. If you conceive it, you believe it, you can achieve it. With no further ado, let me turn over to Congressman Raskin. Congressman Raskin, the camera is on you and the floor is yours. Hey, Frank, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. What an honor it is, not just to be with my friend, Frank Islam, and with Debbie Driesman, but to be giving the Frank Islam Athenaeum Annual Address. Uh, how cool is that? It is a great honor. And uh, I think Frank felt sorry for me because I was introducing him in so many different award ceremonies and honor ceremonies that he was getting. He decided to turn this around and give me this honor of being able to give the Frank Islam address. But I'm delighted to be with all my friends at Montgomery College. Dean Clay, thank you very much uh, for your kind remarks and Professor Lee and Professor Miller and uh, everybody who's been involved in this process. I'm delighted to share some thoughts with you. It obviously lacks some of the decorum and gravitas of us all being together uh, in the room, but maybe we can uh, make up for that in some of the intimacy and informality of the Zoom format. And I would certainly love to hear from some people about the things that are on my mind. Um, and uh, I should tell you all, and Frank, I, I hope you don't mind, but I, I'm really speaking here a lot for the first time of things that I've written about in a book that I just finished. And I wrote a book about our son, Tommy, and about the January 6th insurrection and about the impeachment trial. Um, and I, I do hope that my remarks um, ascend a little bit above the normal level of uh, rough and tumble in the mud partisanship. So I hope to maintain the, the high level of dialogue and discussion that you initiated this uh, series with. But, but my topic today, as we uh, are here in the, the week of Constitution Day and Constitution Week, is really about um, partisanship in the Constitution and how we uh, make those two things go together, because so much of the ordinary life of citizens is consumed with basic partisanship, and yet at the same time, we're governed by uh, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And uh, the question that I want to think about is, uh, how we wear those two hats. That is, 
how we think of ourselves, both as partisans uh, who are involved in daily political contest and conflict and combat, and then also uh, constitutional patriots, if that's not too elevated uh, a term. It's what I've been thinking a lot about, the whole concept of constitutional patriotism. So let me start with this. The Constitution itself, it's often been said, uh, was written against partisanship. Um, and I think that Richard Hofstadter said that it was a constitution against political parties. And the reason he said that was because, of course, our constitution doesn't mention political parties, much less does it mention a two-party system or two specific parties. And of course, if you read the Federalist Papers, you will find lots of denunciation of party faction or the spirit of faction, which Madison talked about in Federalist Number 10. And so the, the framers of the constitution we're aiming for something beyond that. At the same time, I hasten to add as a workaday politician here, most of the framers themselves were also politicians. I mean, Madison who wrote the first amendment was a representative in the House of Representatives uh, from Virginia. Thomas Jefferson held a number of different political posts. Um, Benjamin Franklin held positions in Pennsylvania. So they were not strangers to political parties and political groupings, and you can call them what you will, parties, factions, groupings, but anybody who's even on a faculty will understand what we're talking about. Human beings get into groups of a certain size and they begin to form themselves into like-minded factions of people who think about the problems of the day from different perspectives. And the framers understood that. They knew that this was deeply rooted in human nature. So, I believe that they wrote a constitution that was safe for political parties. In some sense, um, political parties are an expression and a reflection of the First Amendment. The First Amendment gives us the freedom to speak, the right to petition government for redress of grievances, the right to assemble, the right to associate. You could view um, the First Amendment as the oxygen that political parties breathe in. There's one very easy way to get rid of political parties move to a one party dictatorship, move to a totalitarian state, move to an authoritarian society where people can't have different points of views. So I know everybody loves to denounce partisanship, but I'm willing to stand up here and go out on a limb and stand up for partisanship to a certain extent. I would say we need two cheers for political parties. What do political parties do for us? Well, political parties express public opinion, they help to organize and mobilize public opinion. Political parties help to educate the public. We go out and we teach people about the census and about redistricting and about elections coming up and voting. Political parties also become a forum for internal debate. You know, do we want to try to improve the Affordable Care Act? Do we want to move to universal health insurance? Do we want to scrap it all? Political parties become a forum for having meaningful, substantive discussion about stuff. And then political parties mobilize voters to go to the polls. Most of you have probably gotten robocalls from me waking you up early in the morning on election day telling you to go and vote. Not everybody loves those calls, but somebody's got to get out there and get people to vote. The government is not organizing people to vote, but the political parties are doing that. And then I would say even after the election is over, the political parties help to translate the agendas and the programs that we've talked about during the election season into actual legislative programs and help us to articulate what are the goals and the mandates of particular elections. Okay, so that sounds pretty good. Why do I say two cheers and not three cheers for political parties? Well, um, partisanship can get out of control. Um, I, the way I like to think of it is after the election, those of us who aspire and attain to public office have to remember that we are nothing but the servants of the people, the people. And to the extent that we think that we now lord over the people and we control the people and we betray the ideals of constitutional democracy, that is the point to evict, eject, reject, impeach, convict, remove, start over again. We don't need it. But what does it mean? to be a servant of the people, it means to be a servant of all the people, not just the political party that sent you, right? I got elected with the strong, robust support of the Democratic Party 
of Montgomery County and Frederick County and Carroll County. But once I'm in, I represent everybody, the Democrats, the Republicans, the independents, the Greens, the Libertarians, everybody who's out there, the people who hate all the political parties. I represent all of them. We got to remember where the word party comes from. It comes from the French word parti, which means a part. My party is just a part of the whole, and I've got to do my best to represent the whole. And then somebody says to me, okay, you are either being disingenuous or you're being naive. You know, it doesn't work like that. It's the party caucuses that control everything. And I reject that. And why do I say that? Because we know how to be perfectly nonpartisan when we want to. And for that proposition, I will invoke constituent services. If you go to my amazing constituent services office out in Rockville, we are fielding tens of thousands of requests a year from people calling about Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, PPP, unemployment insurance, you name it. And you know what? We never once asked them, are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican? Are you Libertarian? We serve everybody who comes in the door. And I've got no greater commitment to my constituents than to make sure we are there to get you your passport. If you went to sleep during COVID-19 and forgot to get your passport renewed, as thousands of my constituents did, and we are working through the weekend and overtime to get them a passport. Do you think that we ever ask them what their party registration is or anything? Like? We do not. We know how to be nonpartisan. And that's why I was so disappointed in the trial that ended on February 13th, 2021 and began on February 9th. I was disappointed, not in the trial itself, which I think was magnificent, but in the vote in the trial, 57 to 43. Now, that was the most bipartisan vote to impeach a president in the history of the United States. We've had four impeachment trials in American history. Andrew Johnson, who ought to have been impeached for his crimes against the constitution and against reconstruction. Um, Bill Clinton, that was absurd. He was impeached for telling one lie about one private act. Let's leave it at that. Uh, and then Trump won and Trump two. Those have been the four impeachment trials. Our trial was the most bipartisan result in the history of the United States. 5743, 306 to 232 in the House. We had 17 Republicans join all the Democrats in the House. We had seven Republicans from every part of America, New England, Mid-Atlantic, the South, the Midwest, the West, Alaska, from all over the country joining us. And yet, nonetheless, because of that two thirds requirement to convict, which has never been reached in American history, we fell short. 57 is a majority, but it's not the super majority. Okay. Um, so um, I was disappointed. Now, why was I disappointed? Because like I'm saying, we know how to be nonpartisan. We know how to uphold the rule of law when it calls on us not to be partisan advocates and partisan thinkers, but constitutional patriots. And every senator was sworn on their oath of office to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That's their general oath of office. And then they swore an oath as Senate jurors in an impeachment trial to render nothing but impartial justice. And I hope that you got to see at least part, if not the entire trial. We presented overwhelming evidence of the guilt of Donald Trump in fomenting and inciting a violent insurrection against the government, which, which ended up with the injury and the wounding of more than 145 officers of the Capitol Police, the Metropolitan Police Department and other police forces, which delayed for the first time in the history of the United States, the counting of electoral college votes and threatened to topple the democracy as Donald Trump worked to try to coerce Mike Pence, who's hanging they were calling for, uh, tried to coerce him into rejecting electoral college votes. Again, for the first time in American history, returning electors to Pennsylvania, to Arizona, to Georgia, in order to declare nobody had a majority in electoral college in order to kick the contest into the House of Representatives for a contingent election under the 12th Amendment, which Donald Trump would have won because there, there we vote not one member, one vote, we vote one state, one vote, and the GOP controlled 27 states. We had 22, Pennsylvania was divided right down the middle. That was the point of the whole exercise to kick it into a contingent election. I don't believe that Liz Cheney, the at-large representative from Wyoming would have cast 
Wyoming's vote for, to, for Donald Trump, but it still would have left him with 26 votes. And at that point, I think the plan to proceed was to declare uh, a state of siege, uh, an emergency um, under the Insurrection Act and to impose martial law in order to put down the chaos that the president had incited against us. So uh, all, all of which is to say, I, I'm trying, you know, it's very tough in my business not to be partisan, but I'm trying to put on my constitutional law professor's cap to say, um, we had, and we have great Republicans like Liz Cheney um, and Adam Kinzinger and Mitt Romney uh, and Richard Burr, who've been acting as constitutional patriots and took off their partisan hat. I hope I've taken off my partisan hat and I hope we've all been acting just to try to defend the constitution, the bill of rights and the democratic process under it. Self-government is a difficult thing. Frank Islam knows. Uh, for most of human history, for most of the world, people have lived under dictators and kings and queens and theocrats and kleptocrats and bullies and despots. And we've got a great expanding experiment in democratic self-government going here. And Tocqueville said in democracy in America, that democracy is either always expanding or it's contracting, it's shrinking. And we were in danger of us shrinking and even collapsing on January 6th, and we have to use that as an opportunity to fortify our democracy, strengthen our democratic institutions, and move democracy forward. So we've got millions of Americans who are not voting or not represented in Puerto Rico, in Washington, DC, uh, former prisoners around the country. We've got a lot of work to do. The Electoral College now is not just an undemocratic instrument that has given us um, five different popular vote losers in American history as electoral college winners. And it's not an institution that just marginalizes the vast majority of the country as the whole contest comes down to a handful of swing states before it even begins. Everybody knows you got a campaign in Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania and Florida, but what about the rest of America? You know, um, it's not just that, it is actually a danger to the Republic as we saw on January 6th right now with the genie that Donald Trump let out of the bottle because there are so many different phases and stages and nooks and crannies and booby traps in the electoral college that if we don't have good faith actors, if, if you have a political party that positions itself outside of the constitutional order, then in the electoral college itself becomes a danger, not just a popular democracy, but also uh, to the survival of the Republic. So those are my, uh, my thoughts, I hope they're not too provocative, uh, Frank, uh, Dean Glade, but I turn them over to you and I thank you very much for the great honor of allowing me uh, to, to be the, the Frank Islam Athenian speaker. And I hope I, I did justice to your series. Absolutely, yes, Congressman, thank you very much. And um, our audience of about 220, please join me in thanking Congressman Raskin for these phenomenal words and for his inspiring work. I know this is a call to action for many of us to continue our great work at MC, at Montgomery College of promoting representation and radical inclusion, radical inclusion, and also in our communities. I'd like to introduce Professor of English, Katima Lee, and Professor of Art, Amanda Miller, both Germantown faculty who are our Ateneum faculty fellows. They are going to moderate a Q&A that the Congressman has kindly agreed to participate in for a few minutes now. Please post your questions either to the chat or to the Q&A section. Amanda and Katima, go ahead. Um, when you are addressing an issue um, that's already thought of as a partisan issue, um, how do you speak with someone who um, already has their mind made up or maybe even has a different concept of what the facts are? How do you make that a productive conversation? Well, what an awesome question, Amanda. Thank you for that. Um... Well, let's start with this. I mean, I, I always start with the assumption that I've got something to learn from my colleagues or from citizens who disagree with me. So I wanna hear where they're coming from. And oftentimes I do learn stuff and I, 
I'm willing to change my opinion. But I think you said the crucial word, which is facts. Um, you know, our constitution is an enlightenment constitution. Our constitution written by people like Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson and, and John Adams and James Madison, <clears throat> these were men of science. Um, <clears throat> and they, you know, what was the great breakthrough of our constitution? Um, <clears throat> I mean, the separation of powers had appeared before, you know, Montesquieu had written about that. So we did do a good job with the separation of powers, but the really great breakthrough was the separation of church and state. The earth had seen nothing like that before. Our framers were rebelling against centuries of theocracy and religious wars in Europe, which were every bit as brutal as the wars between the Shia and the Sunni in the Muslim world today. Um, and the Holy Inquisition and the Crusades and the witchcraft trials, right? They were rebelling against all that. And they said, look, we're going to make religious faith a matter of private concern. You can worship however you want, free exercise of religion. And in order to protect your free exercise, we can go further and say that government shall establish no religion at all. Government's got to stay out of it. And so what is the realm of government? It's the promotion of the public welfare, right? What's <laughs> at the beginning in the preamble of our constitution? We, the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, <clears throat> and secure to ourselves and our posterity the blessings of liberty. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> do hereby ordain the constitution of the United States. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that when we get together in public, we're not fighting about religious issues. We're not fighting about how many gods there are and how to pray to God and compelling infidels to worship the way we, we worship and all that. All that's gone, that's off the table. Now we can work on transportation. We can work on climate change. We can work on reversing carbon emissions, right? We, we can deal with the practical problems of humanity. So. That goes to facts. Now, the, I guess what's implicit in your question, Professor Miller, is that we do have a kind of politics today which is divorced from facts. And the internet has facilitated the ability of people to, quote, have their own facts or develop a counter reality, which is why I asked my staff to order for me every book that is, has ever been published about religious cults and how to get people out of religious cults and how to deprogram. And what they say is you have to show concern for people. You have to show affection for them so they remember. Because, you know, people who get into those cults, whether it's a religious cult or political cult, they're not particularly treated well. They feel like they're in a group, like they're in a mob, like on January 6th. Like, well, there's people like me, but it's not like, you know, you fall over, you get trampled the way people were trampled on January 6th. It wasn't like they showed a lot of concern for the other people there in the crowd. We've got to show concern and affection for our fellow citizens. And then we have to be absolutely adamant about insisting on the facts. Thank you. Hello, Congressman Raskin. Um, I'm going to read a question verbatim from Sullivan Voss. Congre Congressman Raskin, you are one of the people I hold up in rebuttal when others express their discontent with politicians as a group. You spoke about good faith actors. My question is how we proceed in facing many who seem to be acting in bad faith. I mean, you, you guys are asking me the tough questions today. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I do believe that, that our constitution presumes good faith in people, you know, that people will read the constitution and absorb its values and the spirit of it. And it's not easy. It, you know, it's a lot easier mentally, intellectually, to live in an authoritarian society, in a, an Orwellian society where they tell you what to believe. I mean, we live in a liberal democratic society where you've got to think for yourself. And that's why, you know, to, to me, January 6th is the nightmare for the 21st century for democracy, where it's almost like you've got the people who are the constitutional patriots, the people who believe in it, the officers who fought so valiantly and bravely for us that day. 
and the people who are trying to go forward with the counting of the Electoral College votes and defend the majority in the presidential election against every manner of cult that's out there, the Oath Keepers, the Three Presenters, the Proud Boys, right? And in the final analysis, there will be a showdown between all of the cults, all the mind control entities against people who are willing to stand up for science, reason, the enlightenment, democracy. That's, that's where we are. So here's the good news. I believe that the vast majority of the country are in the constitutional patriot category, are in the honest partisan constitutional patriot category. But we got to tease people out and say, we need as much fervent action, as much belief in strength on the side of the constitution as we're getting from the people attacking it. We need as much as many people standing up for what science has produced for us in COVID-19 as we have people trying to denounce the vaccine and denounce the masking, right? We need as many people out there fighting to do the right thing on climate change, which is the overhanging civilizational emergency of our time, as we have people out there pretending like climate change doesn't exist. So, you know, all of which is to say, I don't want the people who are believers in science and morality and the constitution, just because you are pluralistically minded or liberally minded to have any less passion about what we're doing than the people who want to tear everything down. That's the bottom line. Thank you. Um, I have a question that I'm going to read from John. Um, Senator Joe Manchin seems poised to frustrate President Biden's plans to wean the country off fossil fuels, which is essential to combat climate change. Can anything be done to prevent one powerful member of Congress from impeding the promotion of the public welfare? Well, awesome question. Another great question. Thank you so much for that. Um, there's a great book by Jared Diamond called Collapse, and he looks at, well, what, what is the, the key to the collapse of different civilizations? And basically, he says, when there is an exhaustion of natural resources, where we just run it into the ground to our own detriment, and when you let a small group within the whole society dictate the political agenda. Well, that's exactly where we are with the carbon industries. Uh, we have, you know, we're all implicated in it because obviously we've benefited from it. But at this point, the carbon industries are a threat to the future of humanity. And we, we can't fool around with that. And so there are a lot of people who've gotten a lot of wealth and a lot of power um, through the, you know, greenhouse gas emitting technologies. And they're using that power in a way to perpetuate a dangerous technology when we need to be moving to all of the renewable stuff, wind and solar and all of the new technologies, they're going to save us. I mean, it's a dramatic thing. Uh, I saw that article also this morning in the newspaper about Senator Manchin and how he's, you know, politically and personally invested in coal and so on. And all I can say is um, that in the past, when we've reached these crisis moments, this is what democracy is about, because all of us see things through our own eyes and our own experience. And I hope that all of his colleagues can prevail upon him. And the president of the United States, who is such an important and powerful actor at this moment in history, can prevail upon him to move forward, not just on that issue, but on the voting rights and democracy issue, which is so central, uh, which we're working on, on gun safety. It's so central um, and uh, so pivotal. But uh, I, I agree with you. Um, we, we've got to make sure that everybody is acting in unison. A lot of what I'm doing now, um, I mean, it's surprising to me because, you know, when I was a young man and I was a young man at one point, I used to, I was always the most liberal person in the room. I was the most progressive person in the room. Now I'm like the middle-aged, uh, you know, more conservative white guy uh, in the room. Um, but I'm just trying to keep everybody together. I, you know, we've got to maintain, um, you know, the center's got a hold and we, we can't let things go too far to the right and we can't let things go too far to the left because we got to keep everybody together to keep things moving forward. That is the challenge of democratic government. 
can you keep consensus going without everything blowing up into a million pieces? And we've got to do it because the issues are just so overwhelming and important right now. Thank you. Okay, I have a question from Jill Kronstadt. She says, thank you for your courageous service. As a faculty member here at MC, I'm wondering what you see the role of community colleges and, and community college students in particular in protecting democracy. Uh, Jill, thank you for that excellent question. I mean, um, the, well, the colleges generally are going to be essential because as we've been talking about, there's been a demolition of critical thinking skills in the public and the colleges and the universities um, are uh, essential for us to bring back that Jeffersonian ideal and that Madisonian ideal. They understood you can't run a democracy if people aren't educated, period. You can run a dictatorship just great on that, that basis. You can have a monarchy just great on the, that basis. The rulers don't want people educated in those kinds of societies. In democratic society, we need people to be educated or we're gonna collapse back into some other form of government that we don't want. The community colleges are absolutely central to the process because they're educating a lot more of the people and they're doing a great job. I mean, here in Montgomery County, I think 50% of the kids that we graduate from uh, MCPS are going to Montgomery College, which is both a gateway to University of Maryland and other schools, but also you know, to other kinds of opportunity. I mean, I love Montgomery College and Frederick Community College and Carroll, you know, I, I, you know, I, I can't say enough about what these colleges are doing uh, in terms of uh, introducing critical thinking um, with literature and arts and music, but also the technical and scientific skills that young people need uh, to deal with today's economy so they can become great, you know, fantastic business successes like Frank Islam. But notice Frank Islam became a great business and scientific success, but he spent so much of his time in politics and in government and doing public service. Why? He could be off just whatever, you know, playing tennis or just making another billion dollars or whatever on science, but he understands how critical it is to reinvest in the community because a democracy is based on a live intelligence of the people and everything comes down to elections and discussion and discourse. So uh, I, think that, I think that's the reason why, Frank, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I don't think he's running for president unless <laughs> he hasn't told me. It's not because of personal ambition. He believes in what America is. Right. And he believes in the citizenship that it's based on, that it's founded on. Very well said. Thank you. Amanda. Yes, um, I have a question from Tyler Sylvester. Um, Tyler says, how would you respond to the idea that the constitution is no longer a functioning governing document and the solution to anti-democratic actors, uh, corporate governance and the climate crisis is through a restructured republic around worker governance? Okay, can I, can I just say to you without any idle flattery of my friends at Montgomery College, these are the best questions that I've gotten in like months or years. Okay, I, I want a two, part, a two part answer to that. The first part is kind of defensive. We've got to defend the constitution we've got because it's under attack, all right? I mean, there are people literally who are prepared to tear down the constitution. Nobody is a bigger critic of the electoral college than me. All right, I introduced the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact as my first bill when I got elected to the Maryland State Senate. We now have, I think, 14 or 15 states that have joined in. We've got a pathway out of the Electoral College towards a popular vote. So, uh, so uh, I believe absolutely we need reform. At the same time, we've got, to we've got to defend the system as it exists because when they came to storm the Capitol on January 6th, they were saying, well, we don't need this electoral college thing. Let's get rid of that. Let's, I'm like, wait a second, those are the rules. We're gonna stick by the rules as they exist. Now, if we wanna reform the electoral college, we should, let's use the rule of law to do that. So I guess that, that would be my general answer to you. Yeah, the, our constitution is a living document because the people make changes to it. We've had 17 amendments since the Bill of Rights. The vast majority of those amendments are all about expanding democracy, deepening um, the meaning of democracy, extending the right to vote, right? The 15th Amendment, no race discrimination in voting. The 17th 
14th Amendment, we're going to shift from state legislatures choosing senators to the people. 19th Amendment doubled the franchise by extending the right to vote to women. 23rd Amendment give the right to vote in presidential elections to people in D.C. 24th Amendment get rid of poll taxes in federal elections. 26th Amendment lower the voting age to 18. You see, there is a trajectory here, and so I am totally uh, with with Tyler. We need to continue to expand that democratic trajectory, not throw away the Constitution we've got. You know, perish the thought because you know there are people ready to impose a dictatorship the minute we are not governed by the Constitution anymore. But keep the trajectory of democratic growth going. That's why I'm with my friends in D.C. on statehood for D.C., three and a half million American citizens in Puerto Rico who are not represented. Let's get them statehood. Let's keep democracy moving. Let's keep improving the Constitution, but let's defend what we got to. Thank you. Okay, I guess we have time for one more question, right, Fiona? Um, I have one from Judy Harwood. She says, who is responsible for the lack of critical thinking in our country and what can we do about it? Should we be stressing, in, stressing it in schools? Are there other curriculum changes that would, be, that would make us better citizens? Uh, yes, yes, and yes to all that stuff. I mean, we, we are suffering from this democracy deficit, which corresponds to a critical thinking deficit. And um, some of it is the withdrawal of civics and constitutional literacy from the schools. You know, I, I wrote a book for high school kids for this reason called We the Students, which is a collection of all the Supreme Court decisions that affect kids in public schools like locker searches, drug testing, censorship of newspapers and yearbooks, the desegregation cases, Title IX. So um, I'm absolutely for that. Uh, but look, I think uh, we've got to be honest with ourselves. Um, we, in some sense, we're a victim of our own technological success. I mean, we've got the, the internet is an amazing breakthrough technology, which can be used for so much good to put you know, the knowledge of the world at everybody's fingertips. That's remarkable. But as we've talked about, it's also become a huge disseminator and circulator of mythology and lies and fake news. Um, and so how do we get one without the other? Well, it's gotta be critical thinking and people's ability to become critical consumers of the kind of information that they're receiving. I mean, I, I am actually convinced that I know, you know, people always confuse, always uh, accuse me of being, you know, a rose colored glasses person optimist, but I am convinced a lot of the people who stormed the Capitol and laid siege to Congress really believed that the election was being stolen. I mean, the people who were controlling the action, they knew it was nonsense or uh, forgive me, Frank, as uh, Attorney General Barr put it, BS. He knew that all the president's arguments were BS. That's William Barr speaking, all right? It was rejected in 62 different federal and state court decisions. But I think a lot of the people who came in and were threatening people's lives and saying, hang Mike Pence and where's Nancy, they really thought the election was being stolen. So what, how do we deal with that problem about like these parallel universes with different, different knowledge databases? Uh, that is the critical question. But a lot of it does go to raising educated citizens and consumers of uh, information online. You've got to be able to understand how to manipulate all, all the different websites and what's coming at you and to distinguish what's true and what's false. And so thank God for Montgomery College and colleges and universities across the country for doing that. We've got to build that up. But still, the majority of Americans don't get to go to college, right? So we've got to deal with that problem as well. And, and, um, and our, our founders also had a healthy respect for people who didn't do that kind of conventional learning, but we've got to make the facts available for everybody. So everybody can be civically competent moving forward. So um, I don't have all the answers there, but I'm doing whatever I can in terms of educating young people. You know, I raise a lot of money to run for office. It's an expensive proposition, but I don't spend any of it on pollsters, TV, radio, you know, none of the ego stuff. We put the money into either other candidates who need help, but mostly into Democracy Summer, which is the project I've got to educate young people on how to become civic activists. Um, and 
to understand the history of political change in the country and then to go out, register other people to vote. I don't think anybody should graduate from college without having registered at least one other person to vote. That's a great thing. You're going to change that person's life and you can do it. And then a lot of people are like, wow, that was amazing. I'm going to register 10 people to vote or 100 people. That's not a government responsibility in the United States of America, unlike a lot of democratic countries. So we need people to go out and register people to vote. Of any political party, you, they get to choose how they want to register, but get them registered to vote and you know, start a conversation about what, what it means to be involved in politics. Politics isn't everything. There's a lot of things that people can do in life. I mean, if you look at Frank and Debbie, they're involved with the arts, they're involved with theater, drama, there's great things to do. But politics is important in a democratic society. It's a responsibility, it's an obligation all of us have. Thank you. It, it looks you. like I'm, I'm, I'm being paged to go to the rules committee, it looks like. Oh, yes, Fiona, I, you want to close the conversation? Yes, I will. Thank you, Frank. I, I see that our time has come to a close. So kindly join me once again in thanking our donor, Mr. Islam, and in thanking Congressman Raskin for spending time with the Montgomery College community today. Thanks to all of you, too, for your great comments in chat and for your questions. As the Congressman noted, that's what helps this important conversation continue, what helps keep democracy moving. And I'm sending love and thanks to all my friends in the chat room. I'd sit here and try to respond to everybody, but I got to go to Rules Committee. Uh, Frank and Debbie, thank you for your citizenship and your passionate commitment and your generosity. And thank you, Montgomery College, the faculty, the staff, uh, Dean Glade and uh, Professor Lee, Professor Miller, for everything you guys do. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman. Good to see you. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. We'll see you next time.